Art and fashion have always been closely intertwined, and so today, as part of our Ilham in Conversation series, we are delighted to welcome one of Malaysia's most iconic brands, Tom Abang Safi. As many of you know, the brand first began in the 1980s, and since then has been wowing audiences all over the world with a very particular brand of fashion that transforms traditional textiles, such as batik, uh, songket, and ikat, into wearable, uh, very sophisticated works of art. We are really, really delighted to welcome this formidable team of sisters whose personalities are as colorful as the fashions they produce. And they're here to tell us some of the stories behind the setting up of the brand and also to, I think, demonstrate some of the ways to wear the sarong. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to first introduce you to the designer herself, Tom Abang Safi. And her sister, Hapsa Abang Safi. Thank you, Rahil. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you for being here this afternoon. It's so wonderful to see all of you. And I think it's a great place to escape from the heat of Kuala Lumpur. I'm very happy. <laughs> um, we are here today. Uh, the reason for the event is when I first stepped into this gallery, it was like, wow, I'm at MoMA. I've got to do something here. Thank you, Valentine, for making this place. Uh, this is one gallery I feel that is going to set a new benchmark in Kuala Lumpur. And not only that, they're doing incredible uh, work with uh, the community. It's free, and uh, the first event was with the most celebrated uh, artist, Hussein Enna's work. I hope mo most of you had seen it. That was incredible. And now, uh, this particular uh, exhibition is on batik, and that's why we've come in. As uh, you know, Tom Abang Safi has always been very big with batik. Uh, we'll tell you more about the story. But today is not about just about fashion. What we're going to do is give you the story of why we do the things we do. And uh, Sarongs, You Can't Go Wrong is the title we did in London uh, at Asia House in about nine, what year was that? Yeah, <laughs> I can't remember. Okay. Uh, we, this was, I don't know whether you know Asia House. Asia House is an NGO in London. I am very, very proud and honored to say that we were the first fashion event to have been in that very celebrated building. So we did tie a few sarongs on a few celebrated people, as in ministers or whatever then. Uh, anyway, let me get started. I'll. Uh, Oh, okay, another thing, uh, it's always been in the past, when we first had the retail shop, everybody was wondering why Tom Abang Salvi. There was one time when I was manning the shop alone, somebody came and asked, uh, where's your husband, Tom? I said, no. <laughs> uh, uh, Tom is not a man. <laughs> and uh, the, her name is actually Dayang Fatima Abang Salvi. It's a uh, nama timangan. Tom, Tom, jadi Tom. So, um, and it has stuck, yeah. You know, could I interject there? Um, I've always given talks about branding, and I never realized that uh, when I actually give talks, um, that my name actually played a part in making the brand uh, a bit, um, uh, it actually make people remember the brand, because when I first started in fashion, it, I was like the only female um, designer then, we had, you know, like all the others, like we had Sunny Sun, we had Albert King, we had Alvin, we had all sorts of male names, but they were all were more feminine than me. So like whenever we did shows like, like <laughs> <laughs> overseas, people remember, oh, it's that lady designer with a man's name. And you know, and, and actually people do remember the brand because of something that just happened by the way it just happened. Okay, besides the name, let me go through a little bit on our little journey using its uh, excuse as we're not very good with tech. So a bit of it is has it will go back and forth. If you have any question, ask us later. Okay, sarongs, you can't go wrong. 
She's endorsed this afternoon. Look who's wearing the sarong. That's the latest, huh? It just happened today. <laughs> better, better get your sarongs, ladies, and it's perfect for this weather. Now, that's the kamban. Once upon a time, uh, um, not quite. And there is all actually a very practical reason the heat, and not many people were using air conditioning then, I imagine. And that is uh, typical Javanese. They still do that. Okay, now, this is a very, very uh, particular picture. This is a peacekeeping ceremony in Sarawak. What I'd like to elaborate is the reason for what we are. We grew up in Kuching. And Sarawak, if you all know a bit of uh, Sarawak, is that it was not part of the British uh, Empire. It was actually a very unique rule of the White Rajas. And uh, our great-grandfather is in there. Uh, but we grew up with people knowing the time, the period. It was very, very uh, exciting in a sense, different too. And when you grow on an island, you're just a very island-centric. Now, this is a very particular story. I think, Tom, you should elaborate on this because we grew up with parents who talk about that period. This guy here is called McBrien. The third white Raja was actually completely under his spell. He was a bit of a Rasputin. Do you want to elaborate? Yeah, but you know, it was like one of the, the biggest PR person that was in Sarawak then. Um, you know how everyone just go arabesque when you come from the Middle East and whatever, you know, you, like immediately people uh, uh, get drawn to you. This McBrien, he became a haji. He, he came back from Mecca and he wore all the eagle and everything. And immediately he had quite a bit of following. He married a Malay woman called Sahara who was like very much a sarong girl. And, um, and he actually was quite, uh, had ideas of taking over the country also. Well, part of the attraction was he was very good looking and very tall, but then. So all the women would go, ooh, uh, every time when he came to the kampong. There was a major, major sort of like crowd waiting for him when he arrived after the Hajj. So he married Sahira. So these were the colorful people who were in Kuching then, and we got the stories about them when we were growing up. So we actually have like Eastern wear worn by Western people, so it was like, it can actually go uh, global when, when you have people of that uh, culture wearing them. Uh, and also, Kuching has got all these tribal different groups. So we grew up imbued in all these uh, you know, tribal iconic images. And thus you have the Orang Ulu, the, the, the Ikat and all. They were there everywhere. We grew up like virtually the museum was actually one of the best in Southeast Asia then. And people would actually go to the museum on a daily basis. Oops. Okay. Uh, not a very attractive picture. This was actually uh, an attempt by the third white Raja's wife trying to be Malayu. <laughs> I have other pictures of her, actually. She's very iconic. She was the first to actually marry the uh, Western attire with, uh, you know, and she would wear Iban uh, bracelet right up to her arms with palazzo pants and the kabaya. In Mayfair. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, I don't have the picture today. So as you said, sorry, I apologize. That, was, uh, that is still the building intact in Kuching, and that was the courthouse. It's now turned into a uh, restaurant kind of thing. But this is our playground when we were children. Ah, okay. This is our mother, and uh, she is the one who is actually the, uh, the one who's made us what we are. There's always been the mother who, who would tell us, nothing is impossible, you can do it. Don't come back to me and say you can't do it. I must tell this little story, but during the war, when they had to escape upriver, my mother was uh, noticed that the ladies, they had no, no, there was no such thing as cosmetic or nothing, but she found this fruit called ankabang, which is waxy in nature, and she actually shaped it into, uh, with put coloring and shaped them into lipstick form. And actually, yes, that's the entrepreneurial spirit of her. To the yeah. Villagers escaping the Japanese. Yeah. She lived up to the age of 92 and was still traveling with us right to her very late 80s kind of thing. Yeah. I, I'd be very happy to have a tenth of her, whatever. <laughs> okay. 
uh, she had 10 children, and she was very slim, mm, unlike us. Different diet. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's, uh, yeah. Tom, yeah. They always, it was always kabaya, and the sarong was always part of the culture. Tom, perhaps you could tell us about our childhood, how bati and sarong was very, very much part of the... Uh, my whole life was fabric since I'm a kid. I just love fabric. I just love playing with, with fabric since I'm two, three years old. I could remember. I actually forced everyone to wear the color I wanted. Like during Hari Raya, I'm the one who actually like choose the colors that everyone in the household wear for that Hari Raya season. And it all looked quite nice actually. But the things I always remember about childhood in Kuching was um, people actually buy fabric. And batik comes to the house via another piece of cloth which they put batik into and they go from house to house. And that's when you actually like smell the wax. You get Indonesian women who comes with, with their kabayas and they come to your house and they sell you batik and they open it up and they give you the, the harsh ones first, the rough cotton ones and then slowly and slowly and I'm always waiting for the piece de resistance when they take out the last piece which is like so fine and they put it through a ring you know it's like it's like the best show for me when I was young you know like I was waiting for this piece of batik which was like the tulis and they come through the 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 chin chin the, the ring and my god it's always like that you know like the colors were like that it was so beautiful and always the, the, the most expensive of the lot, you know, like, so it's like, you're always like, ah, it's too expensive. Yeah. But then, you know, it was like on a daily basis, you get all these women coming. And then we always go to the shops and always buying fabric. So that's where all my, my fashion things started with, with um, going to, the, to see all these batik sellers that come all the time. And of course, you know, my mother, as... as I remember she was one person who changed four times a day and you know and it's actually um, a thing that carried on with the rest of us where we actually like <laughs> some more than others <laughs> yeah you know <laughs> okay, carry it's on. very hard living in a house where there's so many fashion police I swear <laughs> <laughs> I want to be casual today no what are you wearing <laughs> okay let's move on uh, that was Tom. Very sorry, it's a bit blur. But this was when she was about five. She was no, still... That's 11. Uh, 11. It was just like three sets of pearls. Can you carry those? I was a lot younger. I didn't say anything, but I said, oh my God. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But that was her, the beginning of her being the fashion police. Okay. Uh, any comments? Yeah. Uh, okay. Before the change of diet. Before McDonald's came to Malaysia. <laughs> no, no, no. Actually, it was before we moved over to West Malaysia. Did you know that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I swear. There was no such thing as nasi lemak in Sarawak. We never had nasi lemak. Truly, crossed my heart. We did it until we came over here. And then we got, whoops, nasi lemak every other day. Yeah. <laughs> I never lie. You know, um, the, black, the black outfit that is in the, the picture was my first attempt at design when I was in Form 5 in school. We had a, 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 a fashion show, so we, we had to design our own clothes and model it ourselves. And um, there were so little things I could get in Kuching to design with, so I got a whole street piece of fabric, which was 60 me meters, I mean 60 inches, and it cost me five ringgit. And I, I had to use um, shower curtains to actually join the fabric together because it was like, you know, it was then, it was like Mary Kwan. So I had to like, look like what was on Carnaby Street. Uh, when it comes to fashion, we were very innovative. Fashion. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, tradition is very big in what we design and it's been very early on. My, our mother was a big, you know, into songket culture and weddings in Sarawak was actually. We had our own songket. There's a way they said the weave is a bit different, but I'm not technically into that. But uh, this was, uh, Tom was about 17 then. Oh, by the way, I must forget, before I forget, Mariam did uh, remind me to say when Tom was about, how old were you? Eight years old or ten? 
she was actually A.S. Fatima, Abang Saufi, A.S., right? <laughs> she actually was uh, an, a radio actress. <laughs> yes, she had a fan club of about, uh, how many young? She had lots, no, more than a thousand. Yeah, there were like yeah. letters and aerograms being sent. Yeah. <laughs> tunggu, tunggu. Yeah. So. <laughs> uh, Tie-dye. Yeah. That was my brother's batik shirt, which I stole from his cupboard. Okay, back to what it's all about, the sarong, the versatility of the sarong. I think most of you are familiar with this. Yeah. There was no such thing as plastic bags. I think we all should go back to that, eh? go green. After all, we have stacks of sarongs at home, and the baby was always good. And according to Tom, that's why most of us are never seasick, because when you go in that, you are able to withstand the, yeah. Yeah. It's true. It's true, because yeah. <laughs> I think that's how you start to, to get the balance and, you know. And We're not making this up, okay? <laughs> Try and, and go in one of these and then go, go <laughs> on board the ship. <laughs> okay. And, and besides that, remember the, the, the swimming in the old days, what they wore, the sarong? I mean, the, the sarong was so versatile. You know, like my experience with sarong is very, very varied. Um, it has become, um, on most of my fashion shoot. Sarong was the dressing room because all you need is like when you, you have to shoot on the beach or anywhere else, you know, that it's like two person holding two ends of the sarong. There you are. You have you have a, a fitting room, you know, and, and then you, you travel with it. You, you don't want to use any of those airlines um, blanket. Yeah, you got to bring your own sarong to, to, to put it over you. And of course, you know, you carry babies in it, you know, and you, you swim in it. And you actually float in it because I remember when I was a kid in Sarawak, you actually have ladies. It was like colourful ducks in the river because you just put them, uh, the sarong on, and you plop, 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 and then the, the air comes into the sarong, and you can actually float. You know, so that's another yeah. very versatile use of of. And when we have kanduris, like you know, to carry um, plates and whatever, it's always tied in a sarong, and it is. You know, first it protects the ceramic and then you, you, many people carry it like, like maybe 10 in, in one tote. You know, it's, it's, it's so versatile. We should really like go back to yeah. using that. Maybe we could introduce that. a, a sarong wig. Use the sarong in the most innovative way. Okay, next. Uh, that is Tom. Go, Aisha, why are you laughing? <laughs> okay, that was the... Uh, when you are living on an island, you get a bit of the call island madness, where you need to want, you, you always aspire to leave the island. But anyway, Tom was very much into clothes, everything, and the MAS uniform was very desirable. And it was one way to leave Sarawak. My father didn't know she got the job, but she said, I've got the job, I'm leaving soon. And that was her. That was my two year stint as a stewardess. I wasn't very good at serving because I was so scared of the, the plane, you know, the, because it was from Kuching to Singapore. It's a lot of turbulence, you know. So thank God, because I know a lot of people in Kuching who fly to Singapore. I actually asked them, do you mind if you don't order hot food? <laughs> <laughs> and it was so wonderful. A lot of all the... The, the people who travel and they, they know me, they know my family and you know they were so kind. I'd like to thank anyone here who maybe have gone, whose parents had traveled then when I was a stewardess. That it was because I just didn't want to pour any hot soup or drink on anyone. I suppose that's our mantra, if you never ask, you never know. <laughs> okay, back to the, uh, what we call our batik thing. This is, uh, most of you remember Camellia. And she was the best model for wearing a thing. Uh, the inspiration from the top is just actually the Iban Kamban. But uh, the story I'd like to share is when she wore this, when with uh, the sarong, she was in Paris and she was at an Yves Saint Laurent shop and everyone said, what are you wearing? They were so in love with the sarong. So I think you all should get your sarong. That's another sarong thing. 
as you can see, that is uh, the motif is very much inspired by uh, the ikat. Uh, Tom is the first person to actually take uh, traditional motifs and uh, weaves and make them into wearable uh, fashion. And uh, the orang ulu motif of the swirls, the circle of life, is very major of that. And these were the iconic images that we grew up with. The, uh, the Orang Ulu is more of the upriver people. Yeah. Do you want to explain this? No, it's just, just um, wearable pieces that you can actually be inspired from something that is traditional and heritage. And you've got to make it user-friendly so that like, um, for everyone to actually wear it, because not everyone will be able to just wear the same thing that is in a museum. So we have to take the pieces out of the museum into the street. And I hope um, some of the things I've designed has, has done that. Tom is guilty of making the kaftan very popular in Malaysia. <laughs> but her idea of kaftan was more of the uh, Côte d'Azur, you know, uh, the French Riviera. No, so because yeah. to me, like um, everywhere I go, when you travel in the world, everywhere, even when I go to my friend's house, you know, everyone will always say, you go to Paris and say, oh, would you like to sit down and have a drink first while I slip into something comfortable? Out comes the kaftan. I go to Indonesia and say, like, uh, tunggu dulu ya, saya mau tukar ya. Out come the kaftan. You know, like, like in your house, you know, like you wear kaftan. And then I, even in England, you know, you come with something that is like loose. And I was thinking like, why don't we take comfort into more chic wear? You know, into more comfort, but it's looking nice. So, like, take it out on the street, wear it to, to functions instead of, like, wearing tight skirts. Because by that time, also, like, I was also putting on weight. You know, but, you know, it's, it's really, like, um, such a user-friendly outfit that people take to, to it very easily because you can dress it up, you can actually use good, better fabric, you know, so that's how it took on. Uh, on another note, the versatility of the batik. Our design is normally we start with the fabric. Rather than the fabric dictates what we're going to shape. And thus you can put the motive and the size at the right area. Sometimes, you know, the designs come where it's just, hmm, where the colors. And also you can mix whatever colors you like. And we believe colors uh, really, one yellow might go well with one another skin tone, another just not quite right. And one should be, although we, want, we, we always try to be uh, current with what is happening on the world stage, but we also try to make sure that your skin tone can take it. Okay. Uh, that was Tom. That uh, was uh, Sarong on the beach. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is how we can actually uh, be inspired by heritage, but we can actually make it something that is uh, user-friendly and more relevant and contemporary. That is actually our knitwear and um, batik from inspired from the Puak Kumbu of uh, the Iban weaves. What we always try, Tom tries actually, to make sure that it doesn't look too ethnic. Uh, but you are inspired by ethnic wear. Ah. This is a very interesting uh, event for us because when Sherry Blair came to M Malaysia, uh, a couple or so of people were asked to show her things. But she ended up ordering a few pieces from us, custom made, and I'm proud to say this was for her official visit to India and China. It was really, really nice to see on CNN and BBC then the, our clothes coming every second, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, very good advertising. Yeah. And we actually got an uh, invitation to uh, number 10 Downing Street, but we were too busy, we couldn't make it. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> but uh, I, got, I, got, I got a bit of flack from some British designers, actually, because Usually, you know, I mean, you know, Sherry Blair, because you got to wear a local, especially for high uh, visibility. So she was actually wearing a Malaysian designer. I was so chuffed, actually, when she did. Okay, this is the sari inspired thing. This was in Sydney, uh, Australian Fashion Week. 
and this was in 2004, and uh, we are still producing this classic, yeah. Uh, Sari inspired, as you can see, the Puak Kumbu. I like to yeah. mention also here that it's so nice to see some people wearing sari. I think Mrs. Joseph, you're wearing a sari. Yeah, you know, because that's the whole philosophy of, of our design. We actually don't use zips, buttons and, and, and fastenings. We actually get inspired by um, the saris, the bajukurongs, the kimonos, um, sarongs, um, kabayas. You know, like, like none of them actually have buttons or zips. Um, in actual fact, um, like the story of the Baju Kurong and the Baju Kabai Labo, you know, the, the slit started when hairstyles started to get bigger and you can't put through your, your Baju Kurong through your hair. <laughs> this is uh, MIFA, a Malaysian Fashion Week. 2005, I think. Uh, this was the year that uh, Tom Abangsafi was uh, awarded the design of the year. And this is a very special design. This is a sarong which she called the salt sarong. She wanted to put a bit of salsa in the sarong. Yeah. I have a sample to show. It can wrap around somebody if I'm disinterested. Ah. This was, uh, I think, Tom, you have to elaborate on this. I mean, you know, the journey of, of fashion is very, um, is very unusual and sometimes it's quite fun. But, you know, like, so they ask you to design everything, you know. I've designed things from a, the cover of a telephone, of a, a, a smartphone, to, to scarves, to things. And this was like when um, the national car was wanting to actually have... Um, a Bernard Chandran and Tom Abang Safi car. And I think maybe it wasn't selling so well, I'm not so sure, but they asked us to do so. I did a female car where the mirrors are a lot bigger so we can ha do our makeup in the car. And then the glove compartment was very big and I had places to put lipsticks and, and all sorts of things. And then the boot was very small, but there was enough to put your sarongs and your shoes. At, in the small boot, you know, and it was very fun. It was nice, and I had leather seats. Short but of asking them to make the engine smaller. No, but, well, we, we managed to do a few, but after that, it, you know, like, then they, they stopped the Kalisa. <laughs> yeah. We had a little stint in London, a bit to... Uh, harried and hurried in our decision to do that. But uh, nevertheless, it was a wonderful experience of so two years at Connaught Street, London. It was the wrong location because uh, it was on, was on the fashion street. Uh, we, we should have stayed longer. Anyway, it's another story to that. But uh, we met incredible people during our time there. Yeah. Very big ladies with wanting more bigger sizes. Ah. The denim collection was done uh, for a show in London at the Mandarin Oriental. Um, this was 2006. No, much later. No, it, yeah. And on our journeys, we met um, some very, very incredible people. This in the fashion yeah. industry. That is, of course, um, Mr. Guasha, you should know him. Mr. Yeah. Xavier Hermes. You know, that's the perks of being in the fashion business, actually. You actually um, meet interesting people, and you exchange ideas, and there's no barrier when, when you actually have got fashion as a conversation um, piece. Another salsa room, where we went a bit uh, different with the motive, very much sort of Aztec. Uh, this is one of Tom's um, very, um, what do you call, she likes using lines and the thing about it is so that it shapes the body, the illusion of your making you smile, it does work and it, uh, well, but it's, it's look, it looks good even on a slim person. No, I mean, it's, you've got a bit of like, um, um, you know, you can shape a body and it does help when you're a little bit bigger. 
but I will never compromise on the fabric use because actually um, a fabric on the skin is the most important thing before you design anything. Again, and uh, with batik, you cannot use polyester and it's got to be natural fibre, cotton or silk or whatever or, or linen. And uh, this is my biggest hate actually when people tell me, oh, you're using batik. But I said, that's not batik, that's printed. And be just because the motif looks like batik, they call it batik, which is very wrong. And this is where we, we have to really, the process of making batik is the batik, yeah. And people forget it is a very tedious job. And the artist behind the work really has got to be what you call recognized. And uh, it's very sad when they say, eh, ni, uh, boleh tawa tak? You know, it's, it's, you don't know the pain of it. And uh, it, it's quite uh, sad, actually, when you see a lot of um, batik makers, especially on the East Coast, where they make pittance. And uh, I would dearly love to, for them to be able to, to, you know, up their price and make a better living. Otherwise, the batik industry is going to die. Ah, this is the most uh, iconic doll that I'm sure every one of you girls, or rather you've had children and grandchildren. Uh, Tom Abang Safi was honoured with one of the designers to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Barbie doll. And I mean, five designers from every country in the world where Barbie is, is known were picked to actually design um, outfits for her 50th. And I must Look admit, the, though, yeah. um, that's the model that was wearing the actual outfit I, I designed. And then we have to make a miniature one for Barbie. And it is the only time my two daughters recognize my work. <laughs> you know, I've been designing for nearly 30 years. And when I actually had this, this um, design job, I had my daughter in London who says, Mom, well done! I'm, and she was telling everyone about it, but she never ever said anything about my other work. Yeah. Uh, by the way, that's not her real hair. She's a brunette, a Brazilian, <laughs> beautiful though. Oh, I forgot, I can't see that. But we actually designed even the earrings for the doll. Can't see it. <laughs> this is a very, very... Um, I wanted to show this because it's a very elaborate batik piece. It takes about five or six different process before you can get that. And that's a batik is not just a batik. There are different types of batik. Yeah. Um, a kaftan faraya. Uh, one of the things that uh, I think uh, my sister, Tom, is very, very um, good at doing rather of she is not scared of mixing colors, unusual colors. Yeah. Modern interpretation of the ikat. This was a very, very fun event that we had to do uh, on our various uh, trips abroad. It's either we, we'd be invited by somebody outside or this was actually for an event in Moscow. We had to do a fashion show in deep winter on a boat. It was really wonderful. It was really well heated, the boat, but the banks was just white, snow covered. Yeah. And that's the euphoria there because it was like quite hot up there. Uh, and um, one thing I have to add, like as a designer, sometimes you also have to dance, you have to sing. <laughs> You have to be three in one, and that's what I did in Moscow, because when we did the show, um, Russians are not known to be very exuberant or, or react to things, and I was looking like, oh, they don't like my design, you know, and I thought, okay, it's okay. But then, you know, then the music started, and people were going to dance, and none of them moved to dance, you know, so it's okay. And then I thought, okay, maybe I'll sing. So I sang. <laughs> There's a little bit of thawing, and I thought, thank you, there, there, this thawing, you know, and then in the end, I just told the, the models, I said, do you all know how to do these two steps? And I did the pocho pocho, and we started the pocho pocho, I grabbed the minister, and I said, would you like to learn, sir? And he did, he learned, and he was so happy. Actually, they were just shy. <laughs> uh, yeah. 
Yeah. And I actually said and announced, I said, you know what, like, um, I think I've been invited to this show because I'm three in one. <laughs> okay. One of the most hilarious uh, trips, uh, fashion if trip that we ever did was going to India. Uh, we did uh, Chennai, uh, Bangalore, Hyderabad, Mumbai, and Delhi. Uh, this was my first foray with Tom. She said, if you want to come along, you got to help with being an MC. But anyhow, <laughs> part of the story. This was the evening, uh, the last evening in Mumbai where um, she was about to take the bow and then the, she actually uh, saw a pianist and she asked the pianist whether he could play a song and uh, she sang. And uh, by that time, everybody was just so merry-making. And then when it came to the interview, the, one of the journalists asked her, are you a singer or are you a designer? She said, uh, no, I'm actually a model. <laughs> You know, trips like this and journeys like this and experiences, that's what we are sharing today. You know, it's, it's about, you know, they always say that when you enjoy your work, it's not work, it's actually a holiday. So I've been blessed with this kind of experiences, but it's what you actually make of it. You know, because I always tell like, like some young designers who always ask about, how difficult it is to do certain work and all that. But you know, if you enjoy your work and you are really passionate about it, it's not work at all. Uh, we do a lot of bidding, and this is on the particular motifs. Oops. That's it, ladies and gentlemen, a bit of an abrupt end. But <laughs> I hope you uh, have had an insight into our sort of crazy journey in the fashion world.